chapter 12, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. The verse reads as follows. For the word of God is living and active. King James, quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, NASB, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of our heart. Last week I spent a great deal of time, and I really hope that everyone was able to understand and follow what I was talking about and, and trying to um, get across. That all of us are three parts, body, soul, and spirit. That in God's original plan for creation, our spirit would be the dominant force in our lives. It would be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God, and it would, in order, bring our soul under its authority. And because our soul was under the authority of our spirit, which was under the authority of the Holy Spirit, our body was brought into submission that we would worship the Lord with our body. Jesus said it this way, that we should worship the Lord, love the Lord, with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The heart, is, the, heart the mind, the soul are all um, synonyms in the Greek, and all of our strength, our physical body, that we are to take the essence of who we are and the worship the Lord. I believe, personally, that the reason there's so much struggle in the Christian church corporately is simply because as a corporate entity, as a body of believers, for whatever reason, this truth has been forgotten, covered over, deceived out of our lives by the enemy so that we no longer understood that it's, and we're going to get to the Word of God, but that our soul is the essence of who we are, our emotions, our intellect, and our will. God has given us a great gift, but I want you to understand something. I, I believe it's a, the great, best, and perfect gift He could have ever given us in free will. But I want you to understand something. While it's a great and precious gift to have free will, it's also a curse. Because that means you can choose to do the wrong thing. To believe the wrong thing. To act the wrong way. To hold on to bitterness or resent or unforgiveness. You can choose to do all those things and literally corrupt the soul that, that God has given you. Last week we talked about the 23rd Psalm. That God promised, David says, he restores or he restores my soul. And I believe that that promise that God will restore our soul is twofold in his nature. If we allow the Holy Spirit to do us, he'll heal the broken heart that we experience. He'll heal the hurts and the bitterness. He will drive out an orphan mindset or an orphan heart that separates us from God and experience the love of God if we allow him to be restored. But I also know that it goes to a much deeper truth in that he will restore our soul if we submit, if we exercise the free will that he's given us, he will restore our soul to its rightful place in our lives. He will restore our soul to the place where it is under submission to our spirit, which is under submission or in tune with the spirit of God. And that's what it means. 
And in order for that to happen, and I believe that when that happens, you will see great, powerful truths be released in the Christian church, individually and corporately, in a Christian life. Things will change for you in ways that you never imagined possible. All that being said, we need to come to a place where we make that choice. Because I want to talk about, in, first, in Corinthians, Paul speaks about the Corinthian church. And he refers to them as carnal, fleshly, worldly, depending on your translation. And I want you to understand something. He doesn't say they're going to hell. Now, I do personally believe that you can't remain in that place forever and not decide yourself that you don't want a relationship with God. But he calls them that it shouldn't be this way. You are carnal. And really, uh, watchmen need me uses the word solical or soulish. So he's saying you are governed by your soul. And if you listen and you read the entire things that he's trying to correct, not only did he say, did he say you were solical, he said you were fleshly, which is even worse in terms of our spiritual position in God. Again, I don't know if it means you're going to heaven or not. That's between God and, and Jesus because he was speaking to Christians at the time. But he said you were fleshly to the extent that you had mothers sleeping with their sons or mother-in-laws sleeping with their sons and, and just things that were unbelievable. <coughs> but what happened was God designed that the spirit first would be predominant in our lives. When Adam sinned, the spirit became under the authority of our soul. But what happens after that is if the spirit remains underneath our soul long enough, the soul will end up being underneath the, the authority of the flesh. And we may give into the basis of human instincts. We are animals by nature. So we will give in to those lusts, those angers, those fear, all those things to give in to. And now, and I'm going to tell you, I have met many people, Christian, hopefully not as many, but many people who are governed by their natural being. If they feel lousy, don't go anywhere near them. If they're not happy, don't go near them. If their flesh isn't satisfied, they do anything they can do to get it satisfied. I believe that's the, the root cause of the uh, heroin or the opioid crisis we see in our, our nation and in the world, is that the flesh is now crying out in dominion to be satisfied, and in doing so, literally destroying lives. The good news is, like I shared earlier, Hebrews 12 tells us that we, as individuals, have the power to lay those things down. We simply have to exercise our will. Now, this is a, a freebie because it's not in my notes. That's in my heart. I want to tell you, I'm going to give you something. Ready? How many of you have trouble exercising your will? You don't need to raise your hand. A lot of people do. Are you ready for this? You're not going to like this. But I am going to tell you how to gain authority over your will so that you can submit it to the Holy Spirit. Ready? Fast. When you can take authority over something you absolutely must have, you are beginning to strengthen your to strengthen your will. I, we were talk, I was in the studio the other day, and somebody said, "Well, they had trouble for a day." And the lady that was there comes to the church and knows me. And says, "Well, he fasts for forty days. What are you talking about? 40, 40 days? Yeah." And so, 
I believe that's why Jesus says when you fast, not if, but when you fast. Because when we fast, we gain authority over our flesh and our soul. Because I, I can tell you, nobody likes to eat more than I do. Well, maybe a few people, but not many. <laughs> I like food. And when I say I like food, you can put anything in front of me and I'll eat it. Just about. If I don't have an allergy to it, I will eat it. It doesn't matter. I like food. But I've learned that when I can take authority over my soulish need to have that appetite met and my physical need to have that requirement met, I can then say no to lots of other things. I can lay aside every weight and every sin. And so I'm only saying that because that's, that, that's something we need to do. A lot of us struggle with, with having the will to do it. Um, that's the best way I know to discipline your will. Hebrews 4.12 says, For so the word of God is living and active, or quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, just for a quick moment, a uh, two-edged sword, the, the, the lethalness of a two-edged sword was it cuts both ways and it cuts going in and cuts going out. Very, very powerful. The most effective weapon they had. But it goes on to say, for the piercing, as far as the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Now, there's a lot more in that little passage there than you, you want to get a hold of. I have never been that way, but I am told that a bone marrow transplant is a very painful procedure. It's very difficult to do and it's painful for both people, the person transplanting, the person receiving. Because I, 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 all I can guess is that separation is very difficult. And so in that process, I want you to understand the reason I just wanted to point out that the vision of joints and marrow, or bone and marrow, is a very difficult process, painful, is because sometimes for you and I to allow the Word of God to separate our soul and our spirit can be a painful process. It hurts a little bit to submit. It hurts a little bit, sometimes a lot, to give in to things, to give up the things that we've hung on to for a lifetime, to give up the hurts of the past, to give up our rights as an individual. It hurts. But if we want the division to take place where our body, where our soul and our spirit are separate. What happened because of Adam's fall is the spirit and the soul over time merged pretty much into one. We need the word of God to pierce our hearts, our soul, to pierce our in the essence of who we are to the divine of soul and spirit. Because it's not until that division takes place that the spirit can begin to take authority over our soul and eventually our body and our flesh. It cannot happen any other way. The word here says, for the division of soul and spirit, the word goes in to separate it. Now, what, the only easiest way I can explain it is this. The depth, separation of soul and spirit is the word will go in and tell you what you thought was right all these years was not God's right. It can enter in and pierce to such a degree that it will change who you are because it will change what you always thought was the truth and reveal to you God's truth. Jesus is truth. Now, in order to grab a hold of this, the first thing we need to understand is what is the word? Well, the word here is, in this particular passage is logos. I find it interesting that that word, logos, 
is the exact same word we find in John chapter 1, referring to Jesus as a living word, and in Revelation chapter 19, referring to Jesus as a living word. I find it interesting that the living word can go in and pierce, and I believe that 100%. However, I want to share that contextually, I don't know that I can tell you that. Because contextually it means, at least I think, and everything I read, it means the inspired word of God will pierce to the dividing of soul and spirit. While I also believe that it can and is the living word in Christ Jesus, it's also the written word. Now, I want you to understand why that's so important. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart or my soul that I might not sin against thee. The word of God will reveal to you what's right and what's not. However, uh, Calvin, an early scholar uh, of said it this way, that those who think that Jesus is intended here, none of the properties mentioned here can be denied of the Son of God, the eternal Word. He sees all things, knows all things, penetrates all things, can do all things. He is the ruler of the heart, and he can turn it where he pleases. He enlightens the soul, he calls it gently and efficaciously, when and how he wills. Finally, it says he punishes the most in the most explanatory in the manner the results offered to the Father himself by infidels, unbelievers, and the wicked in general. But it does not appear that that divine logos is attended here. So what he's saying is that what I'm talking about could easily apply to the living word. He has all that power. He has all that authority. But here, the author of Hebrews, and Adam Clark believes it was a great argument that I read, uh, that is Paul, he is saying that this word, the inspired word of God, if we allow it, will come in, pierce our souls to the dividing of soul and spirit. And in doing so, changes forever. So what I want to talk about today is how you and I can obtain that liberty in Christ. It's by the power of the Word of God. Now whether that power be the living Word in Christ Jesus, or that power be the written Word that we see and read every day, doesn't matter. If we want to gain authority over our sinful, soulish nature, we must do so by the Word of God. It's that simple. The first thing to freedom in Christ is you need to belong to Christ. I know that's pretty basic. If you're here in this room this morning, um, most likely you're a believer. If you're not, don't leave the building without asking what it means to become a believer, to know Jesus Christ personally, to have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. Let me give it to you this way. If you want to belong to an organization, you have to join. It doesn't matter what it is. And most likely, you have to pay dues. If you belong to the Shriners or some other philanthropic organization, you become a member. You go to the club. You do what they do. You wear the funny little hats. You are the clown in that little car that they do for all that thing. And you work hard. You do what's required. And in the same context, if we want to receive that freedom, if we want that liberty to truly choose what God would have us to do, then we need to, for lack of a better term, get on board. If you're going to get on the ship, the first thing you need to do is get on board. You can't go anywhere. So we need to get into that right relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to come to that place first. 
From there, we can then move into the position, move in positionally to take authority over sin. Now, what's wonderful is this. Scripture teaches us, especially the book of Romans, that once we accept Jesus Christ, we are dead to sin. Now, if that was meant literally, no one who's ever accepted Christ would ever sin again. How many have been a Christian more than 20 years? Anybody not sinned in those 20 years or since the 20 year mark? Probably not. So what does it mean? It means that the authority that Adam surrendered in the garden, that Eve surrendered in the garden, where she was, they were under the, the, the control and dominion of the Holy Spirit, has now been broken. They are no longer under Satan's control. They are no longer under the dominion of the world and the God of this world. That's what it means. So while we might still be sinners, we no longer have to sin. We are no longer bound by any legal, any spiritual, any natural force to continue to live in the authority of the God of this world. We laugh about it and we say it isn't true. But what's the first thing a child tells you? No. No! <laughs> they tell you no. Why would you think? Well, it, because that is the attitude of rebellion that comes in with Adam's curse. And it only gets worse from there. First word that we learn is no. That curse has been broken by the blood of Jesus. Galatians 3, 26 says, For we, for ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For many of you have baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male or female. You are one in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed, according to the promise. And I want you to understand what that means. You and I have found new freedom in Christ. You see things differently, you think differently, you walk differently, you talk differently. You should be a different person than you used to be. Now, I believe Paul tells us that we all work on our salvation with fear and trembling. So we're all in different places. But I've got to tell you, if you are the exact same person you were when you got saved, when you accepted Jesus Christ with the same morals, with the same afflictions, the same way of doing things, you missed something. Because the Spirit of God in you will change you from glory to glory. The first thing we experience when we accept Christ is we understand that the load of sin that we carry has been broken by Christ. Now, if you've been a Christian for over 20 years or any, any number of years, you understand that that's taking place. In John 8, 31, and I'll get back to that again in a minute, but Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word in you, then you are my disciples, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set or make you free. Now that's a pretty different phraseology there. If you abide in me, and my word abide in you. Now why is that significant? If you abide in me, that means simply, the word there is meno, M-E-N-O in the Greek. And it means to dwell with. But it's more than, how many of you have ever had a roommate? And kind of just lives with you, you know, they, they live in the same house, they might share the rent, they're not very neat, you know, and, uh, and uh, they dwell with you, but you wouldn't really call yourself close. Well, this is a little bit more than that. It's talking more about a dwelling that's uh, closely related to a marriage relationship, where there's some level of intimacy. Don't dwell in Christ. 
And my word, again, we talk, why is that so important? First, we're in that right relationship. And then my word, the word that is quick and powerful, sharper than two and each other, that living word, that written word, live in you, abide in you, again, more than just, I can quote scripture up, upside down, inside out, and back. What it is, is the word is in your heart. Another sidebar. I'm going to try to finish, but we'll see. Another sidebar. How do you get the word to abide in you? Read it. Putting it in there. Okay, that's great. Read it. What? <coughs> Read it. That's great. I have another truth for you. You ready? Reading is wonderful. But what I want you to do from now on is read it and take one truth out of whatever you read. And I don't, I, I don't really care what the truth is. Let's say, let, let's make it an easy one. Thou shalt not lie. Somewhere in the truth, the passage you read, it tells us that you need to be a man or a woman of integrity, and your words should be yay, yay, nay, nay, period. No more lies, no more white lies, no more lies of omission, no more half-truths, because if it's a half-truth, guess what the other half is? A lie. If it's a half-truth, guess what the other half is? A lie. Right. Right. So none of those. So grab a hold of that. And then what you do is you take that word and you bury it into your heart and soul. And what that means is you now put it to practice. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. The problem often for believers is we read like crazy. It says line upon line. No, it says that because if you read the whole book of Romans in, in, in a night, you're a great reader. I don't care what it is, even in, a, in, in several nights, you will never be able to take all the truths in the book of Romans and apply them to your life in one sitting. So you pray about it and you ask God what it is to put there, line upon line. Thou shalt be a man or woman of integrity. That's the principle. Now, in every area of your life, you become a person of integrity. Every way, every way, every way, every way. Until you do it so much, it becomes who you are. You know what you do then? Find another truth. Find another truth. Find another truth. And you do the exact same thing. You apply it to your life day in and day out, in every area, in work, in home, in school, in relationships, in friends, in family, all of them. You apply it until. It becomes who you are. Line upon, then the word of God will change you. That's why it says, if my word dwell in you, it will make you free. Because it's quick and powerful. But just knowing the word, and I've met people who quote scripture inside out, upside down, and backwards. And they're not really men and women of integrity. There's really no love. They're full of pride and arrogance. And they're just terrible witnesses for Christians. I don't do Facebook, and I'll tell you why. Because I could never keep my mouth shut. I see so many things posted by Christians and Christian groups and Christian this and Christian that that are atrocities to God. I would spend my whole day fighting with people on Facebook. I just, I just can't take it. So I don't have Facebook. If you want to contact me, call me. I'm not, my daughter laughs at me. I said, I don't do Facebook. Don't, don't you dare give me a Facebook invitation to my granddaughter's party. So she prints one and hands it to me. I only have to give you one, but I'm going to honor that. I did old school and stubborn. I said, hey, look, whatever it takes. And the reason being that I can't do it. It will, it's just, and this is Christian people. <coughs> Christians talk about things that they do. They go on mission trips and they do this. And they say things that are unscriptural. <coughs> My nature is, I have to correct it. And I will tell you, that is not how you win, fl win friends and influence people. So I don't have Facebook. But what you need to do is get the word of God. <coughs> To your soul, into your heart. Meditate on it. <coughs> to practice in your life until it becomes your new nature. Be transformed. Then 
metamorphosized into a new man by the renewing of your mind. And that truth will set you free. Let me give you an example. One more example, and I'll move to the next. Oh, she's up here there. Okay, I gotta move fast. How many in the room have ever had problems with self-esteem? I don't, I'm not good enough, I don't look good enough, I'm not smart enough, any of those things. I'm going to tell you how to correct that right here and right now. Are you ready? You look for every scripture you can find that tells you what God thinks of you. And then every single time, you have an I'm not good enough thought, I'm not smart enough, I'm not skinny enough, I'm not fat enough, I'm not tall enough. Remind yourself of those scriptures and let those words set you free. I get to tell you something. I, I know by God's grace I'm forgiven, but I'm not perfect. But I don't really care what anybody says or thinks about me because I know one thing. My father is well pleased. God calls me the apple of his eye. His beloved son. If you really understand that, it won't matter what you think or anybody else thinks. And your soul will be restored to its rightful place. challenge you today to come to a place where we have liberty in Christ. How do we do that? Simply, we know that we, it begins with the personal experience through Jesus Christ, and I want to be free in me. I want you to understand something. How many of you know pretty much freedom is in our DNA as human beings? We all want to be free. Everywhere, every place in the world. Thomas Jefferson simply said it. Um, we hold these truths self-evident that all men, all men are created equal, endowed by the Creator with unaided lights, life, liberty, or freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. They belong to us. We think it's written in our DNA. And that's not just for the United States. That's the world. We believe it for everybody. And that's on a natural sense. In the same thing that it was a, a fundamental expression of faith and eternal truth that birthed what I consider the greatest nation of the world. However, despite all that, the great blessing that we enjoy in our nation is freedom. There are countless people in this country who are in great bondage, bondage to sin, pain, injustices, bondage to self, men who enjoy the pursuit of our unalienable rights find themselves weighed down by the chains of sin. The bonded manifest themselves through bodily or fleshly vices which often consume the best part of the person. Men and women may be politically free. They might find themselves bound under the tyranny of Tyrannical, tyrannical control, I'm sorry, of the God of this age, Satan himself. And while that DNA, that freedom might be embedded in every soul and every human being everywhere, it causes them to cry out for that freedom on some surface. How do we get there? John 8.36. And I'm just going to close with these four quick truths. John 8.36 says, So if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. First, freedom is possible. You hear the verse? If 
the Son. It's possible. You can be made free by the Son of God, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, by communion and relationship with Him. Freedom is yours. The word, that is a big word, but it, it has, it's a little word with great meanings. If I had never done this, if I never made a mistake, if I never did this, if I invested, if I invested in Google, if I married the right person, if and, and I don't believe that one, but if you if you believe the word if has great meaning, and I'm going to tell you something in this context, it's a godly gift, but most of the time it's a satanic gift. If you did this this way, things would be different. If you, did, if you didn't believe, if you weren't a Christian, if you were, if is a little word that has great meaning and implication. But listen to the meaning here. If the sun sets you free. Wow. Freedom is possible. How do you want to know you're free? You, your soul can be restored this morning. Number two, the cost of freedom has been paid. The sun, Calvary, the death, burial, and resurrection, the pain on the cross, the passion that he experienced, the beatings, the brutal, the crown, every, every single error of our lives in which had to be judged for sin and for Adam's Full has been placed upon Jesus Christ. The Son has paid the price for our freedom. Number three. The transaction of freedom. If the Son makes you free, so it's personal. You want to be free? You make a decision to accept Jesus Christ. You want to be free? You make a decision to allow His Word to abide in you. If you want to be free, you make a decision. You surrender your will and allow His will to begin to permeate your heart, mind, and soul. And freedom is yours. It's personal. It's not corporate. I can't do it for you. The president can't do it for you. Your congressman, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. Nobody can do it for you. It's a personal choice to be free. You choose to be free. If the sun sets free, it's free indeed. The transaction of freedom has already taken place. And finally, the extent of your freedom is perpetual. You shall be free indeed. Not once, not a little bit, but forever. It's a continual process of freedom. That's why it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's a daily walk. It's a daily process. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Glory of glory. We are changed. That happens. When we accept the freedom that comes through death, burial, and Jesus, or resurrection of Jesus Christ, we accept the freedom that Calvary brought us, and then we allow His Word to abide in us. And I mean that to a fault the living Word in Christ Jesus, an inspired Word. Now, Paul said, I have learned to be content with the ground. It sounds like a great quality, and it is. But God didn't promise that you would be content. He said that you would have life and have it more abundantly. That word life is Zoe, the very fullness, the very wholeness of who you are. Not just, it means happy. It means joyful. It means physically, emotionally, spiritually provided for. It means it all. You can have it abundantly, not 
pretending. And I think a lot of Christians have settled for I'm content. That's what God wants you to be. And you know what? God does want you to be content. Not envious, not covetous, not jealous. But I've got to tell you something. There's a difference between content and complacent. Content means I'm in this place now. God is calling to be abundant. Understand the difference? Complacent is, here I am. If I don't make any mistakes, I'll make it to heaven. It's a long, slow walk, but it's okay. I know where I'm going. He doesn't want that. He wants you to live life abundantly, leaping and jumping and praising God. Amen? Let's pray, because I'm going to start over again. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would increase in us. We surrender our souls. We submit to you this morning. We are in Christ. We ask, Lord, that the word of God that is quick and powerful would abide in us. Renew us, line upon line, precept upon precept. Send us from glory to glory that we might truly be free and understand.